Good evening and welcome to the first ever episode of my new YouTube board gaming channel, The Boardmasters. My name is Chris Mullins and for this first video tonight, there's a few little things I want to do first. So I'm going to introduce myself and what I'm hoping for the channel. I'm also going to make an apology and a plea for patience. And then I'm going to dive in and start a playthrough of the seventh continent. And I'll probably look to play about 20 to 30 minutes of that. And then I'll look to end it on a choice that I'm hoping I can get some feedback from the community. Uh, leave your answers down below in terms of what you want me to do. And then I can start that up next week. Hopefully there will be timestamps on this video. I've never timestamped anything in my life as I'm about to explain. I'm completely brand new to basically everything in this space and with content creation. So hopefully it is something that will be nice and easy and I can do it. And there will be timestamps down below. So if you want to skip ahead to the gameplay, feel free. Otherwise, there may not be. But <laughs> if there isn't, you know, it's because I'm still learning. And again, that will be part of the apology and the bearing with me later. So to begin with, as I said, my name is Chris Mullins. I decided to do this channel kind of as a bit of fun, really. I mean, I've never done any sort of content creation before in my life. I've never done any sort of editing. I've never uploaded, as I've just said. I, I've never timestamped anything. I've never been filmed speaking to a camera. This is something that generally is a situation that I would avoid at all costs. This is very out of character and pretty uncomfortable for me to begin with. I'm hoping, you know, a bit of personal growth over the next few weeks and months and I'll, this will start feeling a bit natural and I'll enjoy it more and more. My, in terms of my history with games, I've always been a video gamer as opposed to a board gamer. Um, this time last year, so the start of 2020, I owned three board games. So I had XCOM, the board game, Lord of the Rings, the living card game and Marvel Legendary. So they were games that I bought because I loved the IP, not anything to do with their, their quality as a board game or any board game knowledge I had. It was just literally, I loved the IP and I think probably from gaming websites every now and again have a board game article when they appeal to me and I grab them. I think 12 months on, I've got, I think a, around 25. I've got another five uh, arriving this week. Countless more on pre-order and Kickstarters and things. So this hobby for me has really exploded over the past 12 months, particularly the last six months, really. Uh, up until the summer, I think I'd back Return to Dark Tower after being bombarded on Facebook for it and it just looking really special. And with that, the floodgates really opened over the summer. I think with, with COVID and lockdown and everything, I was all right to begin with, but then it got to a point where I think buying board games on Kickstarter in particular was my way of coping with everything. And I went all in on that as you'll see in the coming weeks and months, because hopefully they will all be making appearances on the channel soon enough. Again, many of the people that will be appearing on the channel with me, like for example, my wife, my son, most of my friends who have shown an interest so far are similar to me in that they have no history in board games. I know one or two have, but in the most, in the main, sorry, uh, we are a bunch of noobs and that kind of contributed to the name really because I, I can appreciate a board game channel being called The Board Masters sounds pretty arrogant but it isn't intended that way at all. The reasons for it are I'm based in Cornwall and probably the one major event Cornwall was known for on a yearly basis prior to Covid was a music and surfing festival in Newquay called Boardmasters. Obviously a different type of board, but we thought we may as well piggyback off the back of that. And, you know, we're making use of board games, so we will be the Boardmasters. And it was quite an ironic name for us that we found quite amusing because 
we are actually, uh, as I've said, a bunch of noobs and about as far from being board masters as you possibly can get in this space. So that is the history of the name. So why am I doing a channel? Again, I've mentioned it was just a bit of fun, but I think for me, I got so into this space over the last six months from because of the social aspect. As I mentioned, I was a video gamer all my life. Uh, that was always single player, offline, big narrative, role-playing games generally. So I've never really done online multiplayer, so that's never been a social thing for me. And over the past, certainly seven, eight years, certainly since we've got a house, had a son, I haven't been going out, you know, drinking with the lads and stuff like I did when I was growing up. So that side of my social life has really disappeared. And I think I'd come to terms with it really over the past seven, eight years. I just sort of accepted that I wasn't going to have much of a social life outside of my family and work. But as soon as I sort of expressed an interest in this, people who acquaintances and people I'd known for years were like, oh, yeah, I'd be quite interested in playing. And it's taken off from there. I love it. I love the social aspect. I find just generally in life, whether I'm watching a film or a TV series or playing a video game, even ones that I absolutely love, I'm checking my phones every two minutes just to, in case I miss something, which I invariably haven't. Whereas when I'm, when I'm playing a board game, I don't think about it. I'm just in that space. I'm completely invested and I love that feeling and just being around people. And I wanted to document that as much as anything. These videos are as much for me as for putting anything out there or, I don't know, trying to monetize anything in the future. That's something I haven't even dreamt could be a possibility, really, because I don't imagine my little social group is ever going to attract an audience big enough to get to that point. So, yeah, it, as I said, it's sort of a mixture of documenting my journey as well as self-therapy in terms of talking to a camera and everything and learning new skills in terms of how to film, how to edit, all those sort of things. And I think that leads nicely into the sort of apology and pleading for patience as much as anything. This is actually one of the last videos I'm going to be shooting before the channel goes live because I wanted to film this once I was in a position to do that. So I'm hoping it will look okay. A lot of the stuff over the last two or three months that I filmed and edited haven't, hasn't been great and I appreciate that and that's why I want to apologise first and foremost. I've got a lot of the footage to a point where I can't really do any more. I don't think with my level of expertise and my equipment because at the moment I'm filming off my mobile phone. I've commandeered my wife's mobile phone for this. Uh, over the past few months when I've been filming, I've been using my old phone or my wife's old phone. And quite regularly, we were finding that they were switching off or shutting down after 20, 30 minutes. So there will be videos where halfway through one of the camera angles drops, because I always want to try when I'm doing board gaming to have a camera that I'm looking at, as well as a camera looking down at the table. I know, for example, the first Lord of the Rings playthrough I did with Kurt. I had the old, my old phone doing this angle, whereas my current phone was doing the top down and halfway through the game, unbeknownst to me, the old phone shut down due to either overheating or battery or something. And we were stuck with just the top down view for the rest of the game, which I tried to, you know, edit it with B-roll and stuff to make it look okay, but I can appreciate it's not great. And similar things happened with Dinosaur Island and Takenoko and until we got to the point where I think my wife got as frustrated as me and gave in to let me use her newer phone, which, you know, touch wood, these two phones seem to be fairly consistent at going throughout. Obviously their cameras aren't the best. I'm not working with top of the range equipment. I, I'm filming in my dining room at the moment. I'm currently getting my garage converted, hopefully into a games room with a proper gaming table coming. So hopefully that will be better lighting as opposed to just standard ceiling lights and a lamp. 
I'm not wearing microphones because again, I've invested so much in the board game side of it. I'm not really willing at this point to spend a small fortune on equipment for something that is as much just for me as anything else. If the channel ever gets to a point where it's successful and it would make sense to upgrade my equipment, then that's something I'll definitely look at at the time. But as a bit of fun to begin with, I'll make do with what I have. And I hope that you will forgive me and bear with me through that process. Again, as I've said on top of that, it's very much a learning process for me. I've never edited something before in my life. And the first movie or the first video that I recorded was an unboxing of Super Club. And I recorded it. I spent hours editing it. I was really happy with it. I asked my wife to sit down and have a look. And two seconds after I turned it on, she turned to me and asked me, why did you film it in portrait? And it's just the biggest rookie mistake <laughs> you can make, really. I, it never even occurred to me. I spent, again, three or four hours editing it, getting it to a point where I was happy, and then without ever picking up that it was portrait, when really we should be shooting in landscape. So I've got rookie errors of that. And with it being an unboxing, I didn't feel like I could reshoot it. So I, I've had to leave it as is. Uh, as I've mentioned, the editing process and things, I've, I'm have i using Shotcut, which is a free editing software. So I'm sure there are better softwares out there, but that is what I'm working with at the moment. And hopefully I'm able to cut together some decent footage. I, I There's a number of videos that I do like what I've done. But you know, the, I know a lot of content creators always say, you're always learning, you're always getting better, you're always practicing your skills. So no matter where your starting point is, six months, a year, two years down the line, you look back at what you did before and you'll cringe because the quality is just nowhere near what you would like. And I am painfully aware that's going to be the case with this channel. And again, I'm just hoping you're willing to bear with me during that process because I think we'll have some decent entertaining stuff. Or at least I hope it will. I, I've certainly enjoyed it. But with that said... I think it's time to dive into the actual gameplay, into Seventh Continent. And, you know, obligatory spoiler warning, this is a very narrative-driven game. It's not sort of a replayable game as such. It's a choose-your-own board game, so if you're familiar with fighting fantasy books as I was growing up, it's kind of like one of those, but in a board game style. And as well, I've had a quick play around with it just to get an idea of the mechanics, but I'm going to play through it as if I'm coming at it as a first time playthrough. This isn't going to be a deep how to play video as such. So I'll explain kind of what I'm doing and why, but I'm not necessarily going to go into the deep mechanics of why I'm doing it and how the, each thing works and interacts because I'm probably not at that level of skill yet. Sorry about that. <clears throat> So I'm going to start with the curse known as the Crystal Song, which is something they released after the initial box as sort of a shorter tutorial curse, because I understand the three that come in the box are very substantial, like 10, 15, 20 hours. And they're going to be the bulk of this. Well, not necessarily the channel, but the playlist on this channel. This will hopefully be a regular feature where once a week, I will have a playthrough of Seventh Continent and be able to put into action your suggestions and things. Alongside that, there will be a lot of unboxings and playthroughs and reviews and things like that. But getting into the Crystal Song. So the background to the, the curse and the mission. <clears throat> you were recently approached by a government agency to take part in a top secret mission of the utmost importance. Now, finding yourself on a dinghy and preparing to make landfall, you think back to Cap Captain Nedlin's instructions at your last briefing. Many years ago, a number of vessels in our fleet were attacked by a strange submersible craft commanded by a dangerous individual by the name of Nemo. Many of our allies were also hit, but fortunately, we managed to track him and capture several of his crew. Under interrogation, 
The prisoners revealed that their vessel was fueled by mysterious crystals and that they also provided extraordinary propulsive power through the water. This energy source is of great interest to us, which is where you come in. Several months ago, one of our agents took part in an expedition to that new continent all the papers are talking about. While there, he found crystals matching the description of those we are looking for. They emit a faint pink glow and a strange buzzing sound. Your mission is simple. Travel to the new continent and bring back as many of the crystals as you can carry. However, time is of the essence. We have lost radio communication with every agent that has attempted this mission within 48 hours of going ashore and haven't heard from a single one of them since. So that's very foreboding. In terms of my character, I've gone with Keelan McCluskey, who is the heiress of a wealthy manufacturer. Keelan has always been passionate about herbs and plants. Thanks to her botanical knowledge, she was able to survive being poisoned by her unmannerly husband, whose greed led him to the gallows. Freed from her married life, Keelan got involved in and partially funded the first expedition to the seventh continent. She plans to, na to name the first carnivorous plant she discovers after her ex-husband. And I picked Keelan because I figured, you know, botanical skills could come in handy on this mission. And I've just realised my crystal card is sideways on. So let's dive in. And the first thing I'm going to do is have a look around and flip each of these cards over. So crystal fragment. You are sure that there must be a crystal within your reach. Each involved character may discard any number of cards with the keyword vigilance from their hand or inventory. For each card discarded this way, you get stars during the result step of the following action. Okay, so we've got a crystal fragment card right at the beginning and we can discard cards with the keyword of vigilance from our hand or inventory. For each card discarded that way, you get a star in order to get a crystal. Now, as this is my first go, typically I haven't got anything in my hand yet, so I'm not going to attempt to resolve that yet. So let's have a look to see what we have here. <clears throat> Lunch. A plump seagull is hopping around just a few yards from you. If you're a vegetarian, just ignore it. So let's see what we can do. So draw one card and hope for two stars. Nope. So we are unsuccessful in that one, so we can discard that one. And I got a card for my hand. You get more experienced. Take one three card for each other knowledge of power card in the hands of all involved characters. So I'll save that for the moment. So now we've discarded this lunch card. That goes into the past, which is there. And we need card number six to be this new terrain card. There is no smoke here, some moss, and even a few bamboo-like canes grow in this area. Okay. And then we'll have a look at this one. Spider bite. Your calf is itching uncomfortably. Examining it, you notice a nasty red spot. You must have been bitten by a spider, and you can only hope it has not laid its eggs under your skin. So I can choose to draw any number of cards to heal the wound, or I can eggs under your skin, certainly not possible, banish this. I'm sure it will literally come back to bite me in the future, but I'm going not going to waste my action cards on this, so I'm just gonna banish it and hope for the best later on. And then I need card number 15. That's the new terrain tile. Here we are. The terrain is split in two by a small bay. The waves break and crash loudly against the jagged rocks. Getting to the other side is not going to be an easy task. Okay. 
So that looks like it's going to be a bit of a mission getting across there. So I think what I'm going to do next is fully explore the card that I'm on. So I've got a card um, explore action at number 13 there that doesn't take any cards. So I'm going to choose to do that first. You walk towards the dead seagull. When you are just a few feet from it, a gout of steam spurts from the ground and severely burns you. This is definitely not your day. Amazing. Okay. So I've got burned. So I've put that in the past and I need to take a 104 card. Okay. Superficial burn, deep cut or fractured bone. Injuries on the seventh continent can be extremely life threatening. So the injury, right, so I am injured. I can choose to attempt to heal that at any point. I need to draw at least two cards to get three stars in order to get rid of that. I'll probably leave that for the moment. The next action I've got is another explore card where I need to draw at least one card in order to get zero stars. So I'll just go with one because I know it succeed. And it's a friction fire, which I will add to my inventory. Or to my hand, not my inventory yet, because I haven't crafted it. And then I will explore card number 34. There we go. So bright red seaweed is clinging tightly to the rock. Perhaps it is edible. You tear a piece of seaweed and give it a taste. As soon as your tongue starts to tingle, you spit it out immediately. However, its flexible and strong stem might prove useful. Immediately after this is revealed, take a 29 card from the event adventure deck if available. So 29. There we go. Red seaweed. So the stem of this red seaweed is both flexible and strong. It could easily be crafted into some nice cordage or as a component in other equipment. So when this seaweed can be seen on your terrain card, you also have the vine resource for crafting. That is very handy indeed. So I'll add that to my satchel. I've also got a 77 card, which is a 777 card which is the easy mode. It's basically an extra life. Hopefully we won't need it, but we'll see. And that is that card pretty much fully explored. I still don't have any cards. No, I do have one card with the word vigilance in my hand, but discarding that's not going to get me four stars. So I need to explore a bit more before I attempt this crystal fragment. So I'm going to Take one card to move down here. Okay. So let's have a look at this one. And I should have added in a crystal explore card on here. And I will have a look at that now. If I can pick it up. So the rift, a narrow crevice snakes along the ground a dozen feet ahead of you. There is a good chance that some crystal fragments are hidden at the bottom, but you might also just be wasting your time. So that is a climb action in which I need to draw two cards and get two stars in order to get to the bottom of the crevice. If I fail, then I'll lose my footing and slide down but I'll get to the same place and I'll only damage my equipment, which I don't have any yet, or I can choose to ignore it. I think initially I will explore the card I'm on a bit further. So I've got a view option at num number 12. So draw one card. And that's the, another flint for my inventory or for my hand. And number 12. Okay, from the few traps you spot on the ground, it seems that a small animal was recently here. You 
hide and wait in silence. Depending on, so draw two cards, depending on the number of successes you obtain, take the corresponding number of 30 cards. Reveal them. If at least one involved character is bloody, you must discard one of these without predator. Okay. And let's have a look. So, two cards looking for two successes or more. And I've got two. So I get a 30 card, which is a stone eating crab. You spot a kind of small grey and red crab with short flat pincers that do not really look like a threat. Take one number one card. Past. So we've got some meat, so randomly take three cards, six if you have the fire resource from the discard pile and shuffle them back into the action deck. Return this. So that is going to go into my inventory because it's got a dice there and it doesn't need to be crafted. And that will help me regain a bit of health when I can. Um, I also notice on this card I don't know if maybe I should have done that first, but I feel like I needed to resolve number 12 first. There is a hidden number of 14 on this card. So I'm going to look for number 14. You frighten a little crab and it scurries into a small hole hidden away among the reeds. Okay, so you get a new location. I was worried that you may lose the interaction at 12, but thankfully you don't. So I will now explore number 16 and see what we have there. There is something in there. Following the scampering crab, you notice a gleam at the entrance to the hole. You crouch down and reach into the hole to take the object. A small metal gear wheel found in the lair of a crab. Nice. That goes in my satchel and could well be important going forward. So I am now going to attempt to venture into the rift. So I need to draw two cards and hope to get two successes, which I don't. Oh, I had to discard these after the uh, hunting. So which one am I going to get rid of? I'm going to keep that one. So although I am at the point where I, my hand is full. Okay, so I will use examine the notes. So I need to draw one and hope to get one star, which I don't. So I'll just discard both of those. Four, five, so now five in my hand and I failed that so I lost my food which is very upsetting. And in hindsight I wish I'd gone to the rift first so that I was not risking damaging my inventory. But we go to 576 and banish this. It's interesting, to be honest. I mean, if you told me a year ago that I'd basically be playing a Filofax and finding it as enjoyable as I do, I never would have believed you. But it is what it is. It's, it's amazing how enjoyable a game like this can be. So 576, you inch your way along the rocky ledge, straining your eyes and attempt to catch a glimpse of anything in the dark depths of the crevice. You have paced along the bottom of the rift for an hour without seeing even the faintest pink glow or hearing any buzzing sounds aside from the occasional insect. Frustrated, you steal yourself for an ascent to the surface. You are out of breath when you reach the top of the crevice. Okay. So, I need to draw two cards and hope for two successes, which I don't get. 
Do I want to keep either of those? I don't think I need a flint and a friction fire, so I'm going to discard one of those. I'll discard that one. And I will keep the remember card. So failure, losing your footage, you t losing your footing, you tumble back to the bottom of the crevice, you strengthen your resolve. There's no way you are spending 127 hours down here. All involved characters must immediately take this action again. Fabulous. So this is going to be a way of burning through my health because again, I did not get any or enough successes. So try it again. And this time I did get it. And I am going to keep the bolus in my in my inventory because I can craft that soon. Jira, you may discard this to I think I'll get rid of that. Okay. So each character involved takes a 101 card. Nope, that's a 100. You are feeling increasingly drowsy and are struggling to stay awake. You cannot wait to find a safe, comfortable place to rest. You are tired. Okay, so I basically have another injury and I have to discard a card from the adventure deck for each other red hand I have. So I need to discard those two. And then I need card number four for the next piece of terrain. Progression in this direction is hampered by many jets of boiling steam. It seems you have to take a steep path to reach the ocean that you can see below. Okay. I'm gonna have a look. How many vigilance cards do I have? I've got two. Still don't have enough. Let's use this remote. Do I have a vigilance card in my discard pile? I do. Funny. I'll take one of those back using the remember card. So that I at least now. Well, the remember card was a vigilance that hasn't benefited me at all, really. <laughs> so I have two. I need to find two more. So I'm going to move across to this new location. Do I want to keep this? No, I may as well get rid of that. Okay. And I'm going to move across to here. Now I can see that's got the seaweed on it and it's got the flint. So I can craft the bolus for free, which means I have something in my inventory that I can use. I just need to draw two cards to craft it. Here's and a stamina. Okay. So what do we have here? We have card number 35. So I'm going to explore that. You find a moss carpeted hovel where you can get some rest and comfort away from the elements. Immediately after this is revealed, one involved character may choose one card with the keyword stamina in the discard pile and add it to their hand or shuffle it back into the action deck. Oh, that's handy. Okay. So, stamina. So I've got one there. And that is the only one. Luckily, I have one. Pop that there. Yes, 
still need to find some vigilance cards from somewhere but i will look now there's a number eight so i need to draw i will discard that one hello farah let me just pause that and you can go outside come on puss okay so i will look at number eight You gaze upon the wide, endless ocean. The surf is rough and choppy, and the salty spray from the waves is enough to tell you that the water is freezing. Swimming away will certainly not be easy. On the other hand, if you stay here for more than a few days, you will likely die. Amazing. Okay, so at this point, there's not much I can do. I think I don't have enough... Vigilance cards for that. So I think that might be a good point to pass that over to you. Do I banish this? And I assume there's no crystals there so that I can keep exploring this area. Do I try and swim off the island? Or do I tackle this chasm over here, the waves, and see if we, we can get across that one? Which looks a lot easier because it's three three cards and we only need one success, whereas this one you draw three cards minimum and you need to get nine success points, which is gonna be a tough ask. I'm loath to discard a crystal because I assume that's what I'm here for, but if that's what the people want, that's what we will do. Again, I'm not sure how this translates to being viewed on camera, but I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And I look forward to read your suggestions down below. Again. I would appreciate it if you keep it as sort of specific as possible. So if you want to go across the chasm and try and get to number 17, then by all means, just write that. But please don't write, go to number 17 and then do this and that and this and that. Because again, we want to uncover this island as we go step by step and not have it spoiled by knowing what's going to happen three, four, five steps in advance. So I would appreciate that if, if you could do that. But other than that, thank you for spending the time with me. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope to see you again in the future. And I hope you enjoy this channel as much as I've enjoyed filming what I have so far. So thank you for spending the time with me again. Have a good one. Bye bye now.